This is Maharajas of Skill, a podcast where we go behind the scenes and talk to founders who are demolishing the myths around building and scaling a big business in India. These are the stories that have shattered the assumptions around Indian consumers and are changing the game completely. I am Krishna Jonakardla, serial entrepreneur, co-founder of Flit, the fashion locator in town and startup mentor, bringing you these stories. Hey everyone, this is your host Krishna Jonakadla from Maharajas of Scale. Uh, today there's a on, young entrepreneur Isaac Wesley uh, with us uh, and the startup that we are going to talk about is Inkmong. Uh, for those of you who heard our earlier episodes, I've discussed uh, this possibility of bringing India's vast uh, set of mom and pop establishments onto the internet bandwagon and actually tech enabling them. Um, I I didn't until I actually chanced upon Ink, Ink Monk. I actually thought that was just a pie in the sky kind of an idea. But uh, not only has Ink Monk does that done that successfully, and they've done a whole host of other things as well beyond that. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of uh, Isaac here. Isaac, uh, welcome to the show. Love what you're doing with Ink Monk. Thanks, Krishna. Happy to be here, and uh, you know, pleasure to join this show and share about Ink Monk and the journey ahead. Wonderful. Um, I know Inkpong started uh, some time ago. It's not every day, at least in the Indian space, uh, that we see that people uh, who build something like this have been there and uh, continue there. Uh, take us to the very beginning. Uh, how did it all start? And uh, what were some of the initial thoughts that went into launching Inkpong? Sure. So, uh... I would like to go a little bit rewind before Ink Monk idea started off because mm-hmm. that's where the context started. So uh, basically, a, a middle class guy born and brought up in Chennai, and uh, uh, I wanted to do engineering badly, and uh, I ended up doing arts and science because that's where uh, uh, I ended up being with my marks that I got in my 12th standard. So uh, I had very poor mathematics score. And uh, when I went to engineering, I, I by default didn't get a seat. So I had to switch over to taking a design course, uh, taking visual communication, do it for three years. But uh, naturally, I'm a little bit of a tech enthusiast. Uh, computers where Windows 95 was introduced in my home back in 1997. Right? So mm. my dad is a, an artist slash a, a, a printer. Uh, he has a small printing unit. So that also is somewhat influential towards what I'd built in Inkmark, right? So, but I'll come to that story later. Uh, so being a tech enthusiast, wanted to do a lot in technology. During my school days itself, I used to uh, uh, buy, you know, after your C and C++ programming, I like Java a little. So I used to collect uh, college notebooks and go to my school library and uh, uh, library has a very good computer and there and then uh, learned coding there. Uh, so while I was doing this, uh, I wanted to uh, passionately get into tech space, right? And it was booming at that time. Uh, Red buses were starting and flip cards were starting at that time, 2008 and 10, right? So this is where uh, I believed that... Uh, uh, I need to sink a little more deep, but there is a different angle which I come from because uh, I'm not a hardcore techie guy. So since design is my background and design is something which I naturally learned from a very young age, uh, I was very good at front end than you know building the entire full 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 stack developer. So, uh, but that niche that I was was I was uh, creating a good. Uh, level of portfolios, creating products which I liked, launching them in app marketplaces and seeing some traction. So this kind of enticed two of my other friends who were uh, in Chennai back then were building uh, another company called Wallet Kit. And this is in 2012-13 when I just finished college and uh, they said, hey Isaac, you are a good designer. Why don't you join our team? We are building something called Wallet Kit and uh, we are planning to do this big and uh, that's when I came to know about the new funda word called startup, right? So 
back then i didn't know what is a startup and then uh, uh, i used to uh, work there for a while and then create these saas products they were building a saas product by back then which is for airline companies to send mobile passport through an api right so and uh, interestingly this was the first company that got funded by 500 startups in india okay so 500 startups if uh, you know for the viewers it's uh, one of the second best accelerator in the world right startup accelerator in the world after y combinator that many of you guys have heard about so uh we 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 went through that program for three and a half months and uh, you know it was a very interesting journey but eventually the idea was selling to enterprises but you know we had to do a lot of micro pivots and uh, eventually thought that this is not going to work in a big scale so the company had to pivot in different areas so i had quit that company and there was another company in chennai called hacker rank uh, back then it was called as interview street uh, uh it, this was around 2014 sorry 13s and uh, uh i joined them as a first designer building for their saas product right and uh, uh so they said hey isaac i saw the design of wallet kit it's brilliant why don't you join as a designer you also have a a good tech interest so let's uh, build something together so i joined as the i think the eighth or the ninth employee there in hacker rank and uh, when i left it was a 25 member team i left in one and a half years hacker rank was just incubated by the top most incubator in the world called y combinator right so and interestingly back then i didn't know what is this incubator and all right i all together i know incubator is this where uh, chicken and poultry farm are there <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's my definition of incubator but this startup incubator where they take startups nurture them for 3 4 months and uh, build them for a demo and then produce them to vcs in front of the panel and then get funded right so it was a very very interesting game at that point of time and you know very interesting to see all the journeys of a, a startup being in a crucible right to see from uh you know starting up to choosing the idea validation prototype positioning scaling funding hiring firing all these things right so i felt uh, enough is enough so i have learned from two big incubators in the world so let me start my own so hacker rank was a, a company in bangalore and uh, then i quit bangalore quit bangalore and went back to chennai i wanted to do something of my own and uh, i i took an idea which is very unsexy right so which is very boring to be honest but uh, f- to me it was very interesting because uh, uh, printing is a very traditional industry it's a 100 year old industry there's no technology there too much maybe the maximum technology is in the design of printing but it's a very mechanical world right and uh, for me i i decided uh, okay let me take this market which is close to my heart because my dad was doing printing for the past 25 years in my and that's from when i was born right so uh, i felt uh, something that i can do to this industry and uh, we started off building uh, small small products and starting launching in the website and i used to create this uh, small quicky quirky products and uh, you know even even before having a website i used to sell it on twitter instagram and facebook uh while this was happening uh i uh, met my co-founder called surya so he was just leaving amazon and uh, i came to know him through mutual friends and uh, hackathons that were happening in chennai so i said hey surya i'm building this website which can sell good customized print products i'm starting with stickers t-shirts and uh, it is getting orders so but i'm not able to handle it because i don't have a website for it so can you come and you know can you help me in code so we were actually fiddling around with the project for around 6 months not really calling as a ourselves as co-founders and uh, we were building inkmonk uh, and uh, back then it it used to have a different name called sticky stamp because we started with stickers and then we rebranded it so while we were building this uh, we never knew what is marketplaces at that time right so we were this these products were actually printed in my father's uh, manufacturing unit and then we were shipping it out to india so while i was doing this uh, i came to know that uh, there is a common trend or a pattern with all the print suppliers in india what is that common thing is they all have underutilized machine capacity 
So they usually, you know, buy large infrastructures, large missionaries. But uh, if you see on a week weekday basis, right? So three days will have good orders, and they will keep, you know, printing them, and usually in bulk. But the last two days will have no orders, or which will have spare capacity. So this is when I felt like maybe if we can utilize these underutilized mission capacity and convert ourselves to be more like, uh, you know, the Amazon or the Flipkart of the world and not really put ourselves into the logistics of printing, maybe this could be a great, uh, you know, model, model, right? So that's when this idea started and uh, uh, we ideally built Inkmonk as a... Uh, uh, as a, as an open marketplace, and then we moved it to a closed marketplace. We listed around 550 suppliers inside Inkmonk, and uh, we we went out in the market. And yeah, I will leave it to you. Further more questions which you would like to steer in this conversation. But this is how Inkmonk originated and started. It was more of a, a thing that I personally like to know, uh, that I know a little. Uh, that uh, it was not even passion, right? It was just like Hey, there's. I see. I, I saw an opportunity, an opportunity which I felt like. Okay, this is something I can. I know and I can do. Maybe this is unsexy to the world, but let me do it. Right. So that's how it started off. So, when you spoke about Windows uh, 95, uh, I suppose in 1997 you were what barely eight or nine. Yeah. True. Okay. Interesting. Um, the funny thing is, uh, I started playing around uh, right around the time Basic existed. And uh, I still remember Windows uh, 3.1. And uh, when you went to the command prompt, uh, you could do, I, I used to play around with all the commands. And once <laughs> the worst thing mm -hmm. that you could do was uh, delete star dot star and uh, it would wipe out all the program files back then. <laughs> and you had to put back the OS uh, disk back in and then rebuild the entire, the hard disk was what barely a few MB, 64 MB back then. And uh, so when you mentioned Windows 95, uh, that brought back uh, memories. And I was doing it on my cousin's computer. And the funny thing was he was running a CAD design shop. And once I did that and all his designs crashed and uh, he had to repay that CAD designer all over again um, to recreate those uh, designs. Uh, thankfully, some uh, some part of it existed in backup floppies. You remember those old biggish uh, yeah. floppy disks that existed huge. back then huge huge ones so interesting and uh, it is not every day that you run into a person that is actually more of a designer and an inspired techie um, uh, and i think maybe you got the sequence right do you do you feel that today you've got the sequence right because uh, um, the way i see it is the techies like to believe that the magic is all in the tech and uh, the designers like to believe that the magic is all in the design. And the people who actually build products will know that each one has their own role. Uh, each one can create uh, its own magic. Uh, for instance, um, for our product that we are building right now, we keep we keep reimagining. We, we know that there is so much technology at the back end. The fundamental question that we keep asking ourselves is, what is that design view that gives the user a sort of an instant intuitive feeling of what the product can do for them? It's a very loaded question, but so for instance, and for me, the benchmark uh, app is the Uber screen. A, on an Uber screen, uh, you usually have overlay text in a lot of other apps. Click here and then you bring this up and click here and you do that. I've never seen an overlay text uh, on an Uber app, uh, fundamentally because uh, one is uh, to their uh, good luck, GPS existed and our own location on a GPS map existed for quite some time by the time they started. And I don't even think you, Uber was the first one to invent that interface where it would show you cabs around you. But just seeing that particular screen and taking that and seeing maybe a car, which is a little away and just gives you that instant information, right? Saying, uh, okay, hey, I'm here. There are cars around me. That's all you want the user to know. But that is design. Um, of course, when we go into the back end, 
each of the cars has the uber app uh, they have turned their gps on so the server is fetching all of their location information and it's populating so both of them are interacting but um, they both have uh, but i still do feel uh, getting design right can solve a lot more problems than just uh, code uh, j- just code so do you feel looking back at your journey we'll come into the ink pong journey a little bit uh has has this given you a slight edge the fact that uh, although maybe at some point in time you entertained a regret that you didn't get into engineering which you badly wanted to but the fact that you went design first and you're more of a designer and an inspired techie have you ever feel felt that that was more of an advantage later yeah uh, it was actually a great advantage to be honest because uh, as and when we are progressing in time with uh, uh uh like i've seen it for the last 10 years what i have had this uh, innovation curve right so we usually have this curve of innovation where you know it start off with something but there is a 2x of everything will keep happening every 3 years or 4 years or you know in sequence of that right but if you notice in technology with specifically with tech and in coding and uh, you know creating the tech part of it right uh it has only become more and more easier navigatable and faster uh, and it's getting more and more easier and faster as we speak right but if you see in design it's getting more and more uh, i would say simpler to understand and you know uh, that because we are we are bombarded with different distractions in front of us with different ui elements in front of us but uh, the most simplest way can you solve it and that's the hardest part right design is actually according to me is not making it things more complex which is the hardest part of it right so how do you the, the example that you gave like when you open a uber uh, what is the best way i can communicate that there are cars around you right have a simple map with cars in front of you it was like actually like a game like a virtual environment right, right? like like a uh, you must have maybe uber mimicked it from the games that we played in grand theft auto city or all the you know the the map based games that we had so that was what design should be solving so i guess uh, what was an advantage for me is because i see everything through a design angle i see very everything very closer to the customer because the tech is something people don't see they feel tech right correct so in in uh, while you are typing in the keyboard it auto suggests you that is tech but the way it auto suggests and that that the visual appeal whether you are swiping or you know clicking all those things is designed and user experience so, so i feel because i am being more of a design centric first person and tech is also the backing of me uh, it gives me an advantage to be more closer to the customers and more closer closer to the users in that way uh, you know i see that's a that's a very great advantage for me and usually innovations happen here right when you are more and more closer to customers so that's how i see it right uh, when you said the 2x innovation if you were to read up about how morse code the um, the telegraph eventually ended up becoming the ipod um that journey we don't actually make that association the ipods pred- predecessor was the walkman right so the actually the, there was there was an interim product called the mini disc md which the so which sony created uh, and then prior to that was the disc uh, compact disc player and then the walkman and then uh, prior to that was the basic boombox and then the boombox there is a whole host of uh, but after the ipod happened then acceleration because once things got electronic into the digital world then that it went from here and then all the way till here but all eventually innovation actually builds on top of uh, the work that others have done in the past right which is why the acceleration happens because you don't have to reinvent the wheel as much as what um, other people did so let's uh, jump into the uh, ink monk story and i'm glad you went into detail about uh, uh what happened with vital kit and uh, uh but uh, uh, i also want to get into what went through your mind uh, when that uh, got shattered uh, right um, i don't know if you saw that as a 
uh, job only. Therefore, if you saw that as an outcome, even if you did see that as a job only, uh, we don't see businesses um, going bankrupt or shutting down for some reason on a regular basis, right? Because uh, uh, if it is uh, mom and pop establishments, it's a totally different matter because the issues are different. Uh, did that affect your psyche at all or how did you take it? Uh, okay, so you're in the context of uh, uh, vital kit. shutting down. Okay. Why, vital so, kit, yeah, you okay. get, like you said. Okay. Um, the valid kit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the valid kit, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, valid kit was uh, a product which was more of uh, a very enterprise in nature and it, we are building an API layer for the enterprise product. Right. right? So, Kevin and Ramakant are two founders who actually built that uh, uh, company together. And uh, so I joined it as a designer. And uh, when we saw that product, it was very clear, like, you know, if all, all, all the founders are in my age. So imagine everyone, 23 year kids, right? I, I used to call them still kids. So uh, talking to airline companies like American Airlines and, uh, uh, you know, trying to get them on board to use our API to send the wallets, the passbook, the, the tickets, the airline tickets inside our app called right. uh, Apple had just launched a passbook. app called uh, Passbook app, right? right? So we built this layer. We did not even t- talk to enterprise companies, but we thought the market needed this product. Okay. Right? We, and we also piggybacked because Apple is building, there is already validation to it, right? So, uh, but that was the terrible mistake, uh, you know, that we learned that, uh, you know, markets are uh, uh, are the only source of truth whether this will this product is needed or not, right? Uh, I feel most companies fail there that they build a product which people eventually don't want, right? So uh, that's that's when we realized that this is not going to be of a heavy enterprise model. Then we were trying to pitch it to co- other companies, but eventually we said, okay, you know, we had a great experience doing finder startups. Uh, got into the incubator, got a lot of network. So let's uh, pivot and do something else in life. And uh, that's when I moved on to another company. Yeah. Did, did it affect you at all? Or, but you, you, st- you, it sounds like you were, you felt really rejuvenated by actually having been part of the journey itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it, it never affected all the three of us. So all, all were like first time entrepreneurs, all of us. Okay. And we were just out of college. So, uh, imagine getting, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollar funding in the U.S. in Silicon Valley, and asking them to us to come to Silicon Valley and be in the program for three months. And uh, we felt that money was like free MBA for us. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's how uh, we see it. Yeah. Interesting. I, I want to touch upon the market is the ultimate truth factor a little bit. Um, I I think. Uh, some amount of qualification is essential for that. There are two kinds of products, a product, a product that imagines a problem and a product that actually solves a problem. Uh, today we live in, we live in the, uh, so as uh, Paul Graham uh, uh, infamously said, uh, we wanted flying cars and we got 140 characters instead. So it's sort of a swipe against Twitter that he takes. Uh, and I, I think he rarely tweets. So in effect saying that innovation, even if it's happening, it's really not happening in the right places, which, which actually tells us that uh, there is some truth to the fact that um, market is not everything. Uh, people need to have hypothesis. People need to have intuition to build something. Um, so uh, for instance, if you have a sofa, with a heating heating stove in it. Now that's innovation, but is there is it really solving a problem? That's that's a question. But if people are actually sitting down next to us next to a sofa, it's got a mixer in it. If it is built for bars, now after observing human behavior there, now it is actually solving a problem. Nobody may have established a market for it yet. So uh, there are there are two examples of Nestle. Uh, when initially they launched uh, coffee, when, when they wanted to, Nestle is more of a coffee company as opposed to a tea company. When Japan is, was a tea, tea drinking nation at one point in time. And when they went there, nobody was drinking coffee. And, um, you know, the normal 
uh, philosophy of market is right would say that okay there's no coffee drinker here so therefore looks like we should not even launch but they did they they worked with it for close to 7 years in half a generation they built a huge uh, coffee audience uh, even the gramophone uh, which uh, edison created uh, although the Edis edison's version was very very uh, sort of crude when he created had no takers for the first uh, 10 years of its creation uh, only after recording artists started putting music and a slight improvement happened that innovation really took off so in in some sense i think there there are two parts i think there is in some sense you are ahead sometimes you are ahead and maybe the product itself needs a little more improvement for somebody to say okay i think this is useful for me as long as it's solving a problem as opposed to it being just an invention of the mind so uh, interesting so let's jump into the i i want to touch upon this concept called founder market fit which uh, you may be familiar with it um, and uh, here my question really is and uh, you 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 said the problems of the printing industry uh, people find it unsexy um and i think that's more to do with the maturity of the ind indian industry uh, as opposed to the industry itself not being unsexy uh, or not being sexy uh, there is there is a company called kinkos in the us you may be familiar with it um unlike what you uh, have built with inkmonk kinkos built every location by itself and it was so hugely successful that eventually fedex acquired kinkos in a multi billion dollar deal um what it served was pent up demand and we also know the story of vista print how vista print scaled as well um so there is demand there we don't need to do real tests here and like you said mom and pop shops so what was unique uh because you were immersed in your father's business to a certain extent you had certain maybe innate understanding would you say that understanding of that business gave you some insight into the printing industry's problems and therefore in essence there was some founder market fit when you initially started working on it and it, that's also the reason why the idea resonated with you yeah so it was a bit of a, a natural progression i would say so eventually when i was you know sitting around with in my house with a lot of inks and uh, design and plates and you know the, all the products around print right so naturally uh, it was little being tuned to hey uh, i know this some this industry pretty well so can i see if i can innovate a little bit here in this industry so i would put it like if i was a doctor right and if i was also a techie then i would have said you know maybe and if i let's say if i'm a, a orthodontist right and uh, i would have innovated how people wear braces can i build a 3d technology on braces right so uh, this is similar like because i was there in that uh, environment tuned in that environment for many many years naturally it came to me that maybe i will take something so it was also going against the fact right can i build uh, so what i mean by sexy is uh, sexy ideas are like at that point of time in 2015 if you remember all the e-commerce companies in india were getting like left right and center of funding right mm -hmm. so uh, the the oyos of the world to the travel industries of the india and uh, you know all your uh, hospitality e-commerce everything right so was getting uh, a big hype and uh, you know in the last one decade if we see the highest investment that we have done by fdi in india itself would have been more towards this e-commerce segment uh, uh, and that you and me agree right but, but when i uh, took print and print plus e-commerce as a model suddenly it was no uh, it was like there was a small cringe among people who were looking at this model right but i did not believe in uh, you know external money then i believed in customer money to start with so i was actually bootstrapping for a about 10 months and uh, while i was also building the product so i was profitable by back then but then um, uh, i feel that there is this uh, uh, a leverage that uh, uh, each entrepreneurs do have like found, when you say founder market fit right that uh, 
over many years maybe to start with you cannot do anything right so when i started you know maybe think what what are what are you good at maybe it's drawing maybe it's painting maybe it's something else maybe electronics uh, maybe automobile something right so choose something random or choose something which i you feel that is uh, comfortable to you and then you start it but as and when you progress in the career right so maybe 5 years down the line you would have you know resonated one pattern of the industry again and again and again right so which would give you more deeper insight about whether this is working or not right and uh, and, and which which areas have have that gaps in the market right and these entrepreneurs i i believe are the people who are very smart entrepreneurs are people who find these gaps very very uh, precisely and say okay this is an area like you touched upon this infamous uh, article by paul graham right there is another article by paul graham called as scalp effect right scalp effect is basically ideas which we don't find which we, which is a problem that is there but we don't find it interesting to actually work on it right so what he tells is uh, like uh, the gr- great example is stripe right stripe is an online uh, payment gateway yeah, yeah. which is taking the world and uh, yeah. stripe was built on a very boring infrastructure of banking it infrastructure right so before stripe was built they went to 40 50 banks and built api layers for them and said this is not how you run a bank in technology world so here is an api layer that i am building for you to clean up the de- back end to clean up the database once they did that 40 banks right then they built a layer abstract layer called stripe which is developer friendly which is so easy and smooth and it took them at least 4 5 years the, both the founders to build that so what program said was uh, there are very painful problems like these things right the payment gateway infrastructure in india there are even bigger problems still logistics is not the greatest we still are mm-hmm. running behind blue dart and fedex and uh, you know trying to build a layer on layer on top of it trying to solve problem after problem and put people on top of problem still cancer is not cured right so prof algram talks about it there are enough problems in the world but because right. it is hard founders don't go there right so right. Uh, that is what i feel as like founder market fit so take an industry but first uh, by intuition by career choice or by but go ahead for at least 3 4 years build some momentum gain that knowledge gain the depth of it and then you know start again and when you if you are if you would like to start again uh, that's when you know the depth of the industry would come into the picture right so uh, and i think this will be motivated by couple of things one you will be a little more ahead in the uh, income curve so be- because you are also building your personal life so that will also give you some freedom to actually experiment on few things so right. so yeah for, for me i think that was an advantage and i feel th- certain founders who have who are friends of mine who are building a few other startups have taken their experience as an advantage and said hey uh, in in their pitch deck it was very clear right why are you the founder of this company so they would have said i worked in this bank and they are a, they are a fintech company today right so i worked in this industry so today today i am at this fintech company so uh, so that's the that's how i see it uh, yeah excellent so i guess you either life ex- there's some life experience that uh, gives you found a market fit in some sense or you can establish found a market fit by taking passion 3 to 4 years because uh, unless and until you go at some depth collect some anthology of problems you don't see connections because most solutions are like a combination of multiple low level problems which when you elevate it at a high level so in the stripe example um i still remember for our ott startup back then we were, when we were trying to integrate a payment gateway stripe was still very very early it was still in beta stage and uh, the only choice we had was to go to bank of america and bank of america would uh, and what if a customer came from some other bank so you couldn't accept all cards in one place the chance uh, that that was still a problem and our developers would take about a month to do the whole integration and uh, and then when stripe actually launched they took that entire one month eventually that one month came down to seven days a lot of banks simplified it but stripe actually made it 30 minutes um so what 
you have given is an insight into how it became 30 minutes or even 30 seconds right to put those couple of lines and sign up for an account so it required all of that heavy lifting of putting that infrastructure layer that would uh, do all of that for them um but let's jump into the beginning um and when you mentioned um you wanted to you looked at the underutilized capacity but that was not necessarily the starting point isn't it because you when you launched uh, you essentially uh, took your design ethos a little bit you designed a few products you directly sold them as opposed to building um, a marketplace uh, of sorts was that a conscious choice or was that what you felt this is what i know this is what is possible let me start here yeah yeah very good question so uh, eventually krishna what we were trying to sell is commodity products right so these products have to be pleasing enough and you know people don't care whether are you a marketplace are you an e-commerce website do i need to purchase online or do i need to purchase offline right people for us in our market first of all cared about that aha moment is when they open the package see the product touch and feel that experience so if that is failing everything will look whatever you are building whichever channel you are selling whichever infrastructure you run upon is going to fail right so that's when we we were we uh, when i started when with, with my team we were very clear about you know take problems and take products which had problems right and the first product which we took was a laptop sticker okay that's why we were called as a uh, sticky stamp before ink monk uh, you know what problem laptop sticker had was uh, first of all if you want a die cut laptop sticker back in 2014 i don't know if it's still there uh, a local printer will ask you to print around 1000 pieces because they need they will tell that i need to make a die and for right. uh, you know uh, for that it will cost you around 2000 bucks and then they have to print at least a bulk order of let's say 1000 2000 pieces and then <clears throat> making charges uh, blade charges all these things come into the picture you will nil still not be able to see a sample of it or how it's going to touch and feel until the entire product is done and then finally given to you which is the product which you have to live by right you cannot say boss sorry i don't want this product at, at that moment right so i i realized that okay this pro- product had a lot of problems so let me solve that right so then uh, i did a lot of r and d and buying materials from china importing machines from us i had some money which i saved in hacker rank around a around 3 4 lakhs and then uh, uh, in, imported that machine and then uh, 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 made you know so the pro- pro- proportion was to the market was i will give you 10 stickers completely custom die cut with high quality washable wash proof so which means uh, you can put it on your laptop some coffee spilled or something or uh, you know you wanted to wipe your laptop it will still be okay no problem laminated well laminated so all these things and i put it on twitter twitter was my first area where i sold it right so i put it on twitter i on that day i got around 28 orders i remember that uh, number because i was taking orders through excel sheet so you know this is the back story but if you understand what happened here is that i never randomly took a product i never said i'm going to do printing for everything i took one product which had a problem of itself and said let me solve this product with the uh, problem and see problem solution fit so there is a problem there is a solution i'll first validate problem solution fit only after i validate problem solution fit then only i can validate product market fit right and then right. uh, i built that product i never knew that the, uh, techies were because i was a little of a techie it it naturally was that product that i took but techies everywhere in india wanted that laptop stickers they wanted all their the google to amazon to you know flipkart to everyone want, and uber and ola stickers who are conducting lots of hackathons they wanted to put their uh, stickers inside the laptops of all the developers who are attending these hackathons so they purchased in bulk from me and all the developers like the quality and everything so that's how one product started then the next product was t-shirt which had another problem because sourcing t-shirt was a problem that's when marketplace also was happening they actually <coughs> marketplace idea came in when uh, we discovered this product called t-shirt because we were not printing we i am not a t-shirt printer i did not have t-shirt machines 
but tirupur which is a suburb city in, in tamil nadu had is the hub of textile industry in the almost in the uh, asian country right so they uh, uh, there were like 40 50 manufacturers who print low quantity t-shirts at good quality and uh, you know at a reasonably ad- uh, affordable price but fully customizable so that i can wear what i want to right i today i am wearing a t-shirt which is printed on ink monk which is said customer delight matters right uh, i like wearing this because i want to personally flaunt to people that customer delight matters to me that's it right as simple as that what if i want to buy one t-shirt customized with my mindset right and and i i have some designing skills i have some text skills and font skills so i choose the design and print it nowhere in 2014 this was available at a affordable cost and affordable was happening in tirupur right people were printing in tirupur that's when that's when we said there are not only us who has to do manufacturing there are like enough manufacturers in the world who are doing what they know so let's be a distribution company that's that's when we changed from a production company to becoming a distribution company let's focus on marketing let's focus on sales let's focus on website and technology and build these uh, micro entrepreneurs so that's how we started we we didn't feel uh, think these are suppliers to us they are like me like micro entrepreneurs who want to supply to the world to want to supply to india i i i got inspired uh, partly with jack ma who was building alibaba because he also wanted to do that for china right so and he is very successful doing that so i thought maybe you know being a kid let's do that and uh, and and somewhat it it was successful not as big as alibaba but to some extent yeah so then let me ask you a different question that's pretty fascinating how did you uh, chance upon the laptop sticker problem or why why laptop laptop sticker first yeah so i i have if you noticed in both my previous startups it was like heavily developer centric companies that i was sitting with mm-hmm. all developers okay. had good beautiful laptops but ugly stickers in front of them which was paper made and when they when they were trying to tear the sticker you know it gum and residue will be sticking on it they have to put soap right. oil and keep scratching it and mm-hmm. i also felt like i used to ask them hey uh, do you want to put uh, one design let's say a developer of uh, 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 firefox right and mozilla firefox he wants to put a mozilla logo there he has a mozilla logo but he cannot put no uh, print that because he you know as the same problem i told uh, people cannot print thousand stickers for just one laptop mm-hmm. so that's right. when i felt like this seems to be a good market for these people and maybe i will sell it to my friends that's how it started off and uh, ideally i started off selling to my friends my two, two first two customers and then eventually it gets got spread to that every other developers had this problem and they also wanted to print such stickers okay so was it an accidental discovery that obviously uh, this at the even at the outset of it it doesn't sound like a viral problem because you think okay laptop sticker uh, but otherwise uh, uh, your discovery seems to be that um be- because the essence of uh, getting something right is that you see that maybe two or three people in your mind have that problem but in reality once you launch it you realize that not just the two or three problem two or three people have that problem a whole host of those people have that problem and uh, if you've done a terrific job at it the word of mouth aspect takes care of most of the marketing for it and then you're able to succeed so in is it in hindsight uh, uh do you see that you was there a design aspect when i say design did you see that aspect in the beginning or was it there uh, did you notice it later on yeah uh, krishna it was somewhat a conscious decision uh, in terms of uh, uh, understanding the market so i was looking at i, I never uh, calculated how big the market was right i was saying okay enough friends around me is the market right enough mm-hmm. developers around me is the market let me build that market product fit so i usually uh, people coin this term called product market fit right i i am against that uh, terminology it's usually the other way around where you already have a market and you then go and tell that the market needs that product so then you mm-hmm. you you present that product in 
in front of them then they grab it right so hmm. understanding that that market around me with developers and designers who wanted such customizable laptop stickers and t-shirts was the initial uh, you know uh, you, you can say research or maybe you know initial understanding of what is needed for them the moment i, in, I understand their problems and their needs then i i told give me a break for 3 months i'll come back with a product then i went and did the product and then it was like market wanted to adopt this product very faster because this was the this was addressing couple of their problems so uh, so that's how i uh, you know came to know about uh, this kind of thing actually worked yeah. and when you started making t-shirts is when you sensed uh, this uh, other extended problems in the a capacity utilization was it was it the t-shirt category that sort of gave you that inkling into it true true when we were printing stickers it was ideally my dad's factory when we were printing t-shirts which is when we started outsourcing to a couple of contract manufacturers in tirupur and we were selling giving it to three or four people back then we had to actually build them erp systems where they will get the order where they will have to process it download the design file print it they have to choose the right t-shirt size for the right design and then you know do that so uh while we were building this tools i started realizing the pattern that every other printer in india will have this spare capacity problem right so that's when i said okay we will try move shift inclined towards a distribution model uh, focus because their problem the tripur manufacturers or the the other printers for them sales and orders were the problem right they were they were sitting in a radius operated business so right. around their vicinity their 20 years ago customer will still be their customer and they were serving them happily but what if they wanted to do marketing they are not good at that they wanted to do sales they are again not good at that so that's when they <clears> felt you know uh, maybe if i extend this a bit and say uh, i will be taking care of sales and marketing and bringing you inflow of orders you take care of manufacturing which are already good at and that's when that same pattern of solution i was able to sell it to other print suppliers across india how was the beginning what sort of adoption did you see in the beginning uh, it was crazy uh, people didn't understand what we were uh, doing so we were telling you know uh, we will give you orders you have to sign up in our dashboard you have to put your catalog there and everything uh, adoption mm. was very poor and then uh, we did a hack which actually worked we used to uh, call india mart and just dial and mm. uh, say that uh, we were looking for t-shirts and mm. suddenly there will be 20 uh, t-shirt manufacturer out of the 100 20 people will say sir i saw that you have inquired in india mart i am a tripur manufacturer i can give you the quote and what's your requirement so then mm. i will reverse pitch them saying that sorry boss i really don't need t-shirts but uh, <laughs> out of 100 people you were the one who was interested in business the other guys mm. 80 guys don't really may may already have business they are already doing something so this guy mm. is that entrepreneurial kick he has that kick right so i felt mm. maybe this is the right guy to engage him bring him in the platform so i used to have like mm. 30 minutes 45 minutes call with him telling about the platform and uh, mm. it is also string no strings attached i don't collect payment fees or any uh, integration fees or something like that so tell them mm. you know give your catalog spend some 20 mm. 30 minutes in my platform uh, adding mm. your catalog and uh, then uh, i will give you orders at least one order this week so that's what i promised him and you know krishna building a marketplace is a huge thing right it's a very daunting task you have to build two products two startups within the same startup right so right. you have to build supply and you have to build demand so i would right. have promised this guy that i will bring you an order now i have right. to run behind google ads and seo and do all the marketing demand generation stuff and bring him that order for and i have to repeat this for each and every category so that is usually right. called as liquidity building and uh, this was <laughs> the most painful thing in the building the marketplace right right no i i can totally relate to that um for for some reason uh, so many people jump into marketplace building uh, they think it's just a matter of launching a software layer and saying okay list your list your stuff here but uh, unless and until critical mass 
until you have a critical mass of uh, uh, providers or suppliers you will not attract a critical mass of buyers or users and it is a, always a chicken and egg situation and you will uh, be toiling in obscurity for some time until you get to that point uh, yeah, th that is bound to happen and um, so uh, so then uh, and talk talk through that scale journey a little bit how what were the inflection points that was one hack uh, how how effective was it and what were the what were some other tactics that you employed yeah so the moment we found that we have to incline ourselves to building a distribution company and a marketplace model where we don't worry about production and you know uh, building the machineries or you know uh, taking care of logistics so we built all the api layers on that so one api layer was to my production house which are the contracted manufacturers in tirupur and other places the other api layer was the shipping companies which already al already took care of the uh, delivery part of it so i have built that e commerce layer now all i need to was focus on uh, the landscape of products that i can build in and also the distribution mechanism or how can i take this uh, platform and then uh, distribute it in different channels like facebook or google and and uh, all the marketing activities to screw that so then that time is when i met my first investor a uh, couple of angels we raised together uh, uh, the 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 first uh, time when i raised a fund is fundraising was the most interesting one uh, because uh, my investor was not an investor he was a customer of inkmark so uh, girish uh, i i know many people would know a founder of freshworks uh, and we were uh, uh, ha we happened to deliver a 200 uh, t-shirt order to freshworks office it had t-shirts stickers and lot of things and uh, you know the early days i was the delivery boy i was the marketer sales guy everything together i was not the developer alone that surya was taking care uh, so i was i had a ct100 bajaj old bike and then i put the box there had a, a check which has to be given to him it has to be signed and uh, envelope and uh, i went there with an invoice and uh, uh, and i i met girish while i was delivering this product at 10 o'clock in their office and girish was like isaac i know you because uh, you were in hacker rank you are a techy guy you are a de designer uh, we uh, i i wanted to know like uh, what are you doing what are you doing with t-shirts and you are delivering these things are you working in something so that's when i spoke to him for around 45 minutes i was telling about what we were doing that 45 minutes was actually like i used to take the t-shirt make him feel it and i was glowing in my eyes about the products and the problem that i was trying to solve right and uh, every every minute of that 45 minutes was had a lot of depth about this industry that i was working in the materials that i was sourcing the clean up that i had to do to make sure the, i standardize all these products right so then he decided he thought i said i know you are onto something uh, i don't know how big is going to be but i would like to take a bet on you uh, so if you are looking to raise funds let me know i would like to invest in your company so actually that day i wanted to, i i raised an invoice for 25000 i had to get a 25000 rupees check instead i got a you know 250000 dollar in uh, you know funding with <laughs> girish and a uh, couple of other angels i was very lucky to also have funny fanindra sama from redbus who had built redbus also participate uh, in the round and have him as an investor funny also saw the same thing like we were building almost like redbus for the printing industry like going down in the gutter cleaning up right. that market and then building layers and layers on top right so right. Uh, that 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 kind of very very much inspired us and uh, i didn't know how to raise funds back then but uh, it was like uh, i was taking this direction of being a distribution company which needed upfront cost right so i need to build a brand i need to go and talk to people about hey this is a company you can engage with this is a brand you can engage with to buy print products at good quality affordable price and fastest delivery because we have a hub of networks and uh, that was the proposition but then i cannot focus on uh, uh, you know for building that brand and i need to invest a little so then i said decided okay yeah, now we are still we are profitable and bootstrapped and everything but if we raise this fund 
it is going to take away that bottleneck of growth right so that was the only bottleneck that funding gave us right so uh, so it removed that bottleneck and then we were able to grow much faster so that was uh, how it happened what sort of scale did you achieve then and uh, any inflection points along the way yeah so uh, over the years in a uh, couple of uh, the first year we we were hitting around uh, uh, 500 600 orders uh, the, a month uh, when we started off when we le- uh, when we sold ink monk to printo uh, we were doing almost 6700 orders a month uh, and uh, that was almost four and a half years after building the company every year we were growing at around 75% year on year uh, we grew revenues up to around 7 crores uh, per year in terms of uh, total uh, revenue per year and uh, altogether cumulatively we would have generated around you know 15 to 16 crores of revenue so uh, for all the four years so uh, and we were almost always a tech company in our company you cannot see a printing machine at all uh, the only printing machine you will see is this black and white uh, xerox machine which is near the finance team which will use for printing invoice as simple <laughs> as that this <laughs> um, there's still much to be done in that because if you look at the original hypothesis which is spare capacity um, if, if you hang around enough uh, stores you'll realize um, today at least in Karnataka or in Bangalore a lot of people print agreements and before you actually print an agreement you actually go buy that stamp paper. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how Tamil Nadu is. Karnataka had a scam long ago where pre-printed stamp papers, they were counterfeited as a result of which people buy online live stamp uh, papers. And uh, the next set is most of that printing is around government offices, registration uh, offices. And uh, recently I went to a, a printing store near a sub-register office and uh, we asked him for an electricity agreement uh, supply agreement and when i op- when that fellow opened i saw that he had some 50 templates one for bangalore one for mysore one for hubli one for darwad so different different uh, cities have different electric supply companies so he had a template for all of them so at that point in time uh, it occurred to me if uh, somebody could call these stores ahead in advance Um, while cost of printing agreements at home has come down and i'm here focusing only on a single use case right so agreement is a very simple thing to print but people don't have an average printer cost decent printer cost 15 16000 so at what point so that those people have some capacity those are just your dtp right desktop printers but then you have the traditional professional publishing industry where they are printing posters, they're printing booklets, they're printing magnets, they're printing all these stickers, which takes a lot, slightly more intensive effort. Um, And when I see there are a couple of presses here in Bangalore, at least when they launched, uh, they they were, I think, the first one to buy this huge uh, uh, color uh, print, on-demand color printing machine. Uh, They were supposed to be the first in India. They still they got a lot of press back then when they did that and it's a friend and i see that there are huge lines of people there uh, and i see that happening everywhere and you you have the same phenomena playing out whereby there are parts of the uh, week where they're extremely uh, occupied and then there are there there are parts of the week that they're not occupied at all and you that is very, very easy to see at what point of did you ever contemplate uh, a situation where you have the because of your design experience you show a design you send the design and maybe within a 10 kilometer radius somebody fulfills the order and you pick it up Uh, so you order order home and you are aggregating all of this capacity uh, and then that happens did that ever happen uh, it did not happen in Inkmonk. Uh, in in that five years, we were actually building more of categories which were not on demand, but more of a uh, passive purchase, right? So like you wait for T-shirts, you you pre-plan for if you're printing mugs or uh, you know zipper bottles or uh, caps. So 
uh, we chose products which were more closer to our buyer persona, which were mostly, mostly marketing managers, event organizers, uh, who had a pre-planned purchase program, right? So uh, that was there. But I could answer this right now with Printo's acquisition, right? So what happened, what changed was, uh, so a quick background about Printo is that it, it operates a large retail outlet, the Kinkos of India, right? So Correct. what you mentioned. Right. Uh, so they have retail stores across six, seven different cities uh, and, and operating in smaller hubs. We ultimately had this dream of, can I uh, send it to my supplier where in next few hours I can go and pick it up at store or at, uh, it can be delivered through a Danzo delivery to my home. Uh, but in the five years of building Inkmonk, we were not able to do that because we were focusing on a different beast. With the acquisition of Printo, suddenly it happened that Printo ha- already had this infrastructure. So we said, okay, let me adapt that and let us build for Printo that e-commerce layer. So today in Printo, it is happening that if you want to buy a letterhead, you are an envelope and you go online, you put your logo, uh, design it and submit it and buy it in car. You can actually go in the next one hour or two hours to the local Printo shop, which will which would have given you and go and pick it up at that store in the next two hours. Or you can also danzo the delivery back to your home, right? Uh, all these were possible because at that time when we were building Inkmonk, it was more of a infrastructure play with people who were all distributed heavily in different states of the uh, India, right? So we never thought West Bengal could be the third largest ordering uh, city in India or the state in India uh, because they, for them, traveling or finding local printers was itself a problem. So they were able to order from Delhi and, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Kolkata or or maybe actually from uh, other cities, major cities and uh, get it delivered to them because for them, finding a t-shirt supplier in uh, Kolkata was itself a problem. So suddenly I was solving that problem in Inkmonk, but when it came to Printo, the uh, entire e-commerce changed where I was solving hyper-local problems for people in already big cities. So that became a, and with that omni-channel experience of selling, right? So that was the great advantage there. So let's talk about the acquisition a bit. Um, Obviously for uh, Printo, I suppose you were a great acquisition uh, because uh, that whole online experience um, you had already built out, you had validated it with remote, uh, when you could validate it with remote shops and remote uh, providers. If you had capacity right around the corner and it could enable enable the on-demand use case, and it's just puts their own growth on a little bit of steroids, uh, right? Because it unlocks some uh, demand. Um, so, uh, for instance, if somebody is planning an event three days later, um, and all of a sudden they came they came up with this idea that I want to give away these things, and you had to print them, and three days is too short a lead time, um, and most people don't plan these things thinking, okay, we take, it will take us one week to print this. So let's have our event two weeks out, uh, in maybe established corporates who've done this many times over, they, they follow a pattern. They know what to expect, but in most of the MSME kind of ones, they, they, they're really, uh, we don't, they're just living in the now almost all the time. Um, and you are still very early in your journey. You've just built it, you've aggregated a little bit. Uh, You've not even scratched the scratch of the surface yet. Uh, So what was interesting in the acquisition? Uh, Why did you choose to get acquired? Uh, And uh, uh, how has the journey been post the acquisition? Yeah, sure. So uh, from from a perspective of Printo, you have covered it very well for them. This is a very important piece mm-hmm. uh, on building a technology layer of a well-distributed infrastructure, right. which are already present in the, all the cities. Right. From an Inkmonk's perspective, uh, my vision was also to build this uh, a huge commerce layer of you know uh, with distributed infrastructures across India in in maybe in the next seven eight years of building that Inkmonk journey. Uh, with that only, we converted ourselves to be a distribution company, a marketing company to bring the orders in the platform. 
and we were doing mm-hmm. all the seo magic and the sem magic to happen there but for this side as i told you there is a lot of upfront cost right so for this we had raised from money and we had to uh, raise few more money to build that brand in the market and uh, establish so that this becomes a recurring habit for people hey printing is equal to ink mom go back go there and order right now while i was building that i realized one uh, game right so one is this is not going to be a a billion dollar market scale which would give great returns for uh, any investors who are or a vc funded investors who are going to pitch in so when we are going if we are going to take that route right i have to answer a lot of questions like can this can i generate 700 crores revenue every year right mm-hmm. uh, maybe after 5 years or d- down the line and what is what does 700 crores mean is 100 million dollars so or 750 right. crores what does 100 million dollar mean 100 million dollar is when you get 1 billion dollar valuation and what does 1 billion dollar valuation mean that's what the the all the i don't want to name them but all the vcs of the world wants to be in that space right and that's yeah. fairly very uh, very very understandable that's the game that they play so mm-hmm. for us when if we want to grow to a 700 crore business taking investment money it would take at least 15 years of patience capital that's how i came to that calculation i did that math and i told uh, this is how it is but none of the vcs in india or abroad uh, in different parts of the world do not have that patience capital their patience capital is 7 years or 8 years max max because their fund cycle is less than 10 years right mm-hmm. so they have mm-hmm. to show that investment return ratio of 20 30% within that 12 years so now it becomes a very clear understanding that this is not going to go the vc funded route right mm-hmm. now what is the other route can i boot now kind of to take a bootstrap route of it and say hey can i build this you know 5 crores a year 10 crores a year 15 crores a year maybe grow at 10% year on year uh, but that would not uh, that would because we were a marketplace we also have to solve the chicken and egg problem and my biggest problem is demand generation where india demand generation customer acquisition cost is is a significant cost boss we can all talk about you know i was able to run tv ads and do all those things but my cac is 700 800 rupees which no one uh, you know cannot deny it right so who will fund that cac who is going to retain that cac right and uh, and loyalty factor i i i'm I, i know i'm in a public forum and talking to you in this podcast but i i'm very honest the loyalty factor in e-commerce was super bad in 2010 was okay in 2015 still kind of okay in 2020 still we are not super associated with the brand and paying that extra premium just because we are associated that brand today only we are okay to pay that extra 500 rupees or 300 rupees to amazon because they are you know okay to uh, they they are good in delivery their packaging is good and the convenience is clear of than flipkart right uh, and i'm not saying this because of an amazon fan but that's what they are doing right so today only that loyalty factor has slightly kicked in if 5 years back people open two tabs see product uh, same product a and product a in two different websites buy the cheapest one and there was no loyalty factor on which websites they purchased it right so when you are having that as a fundamental problem in indian commerce how can you solve cac right how can you solve customer acquisition cost you will need to spend because Uh, you will spend but you will have to also have to retain uh, on terms of uh, in top of your gross margin and then get back that money in their second or third or fourth order right so that's going to be a problem right so this is when i realized in bootstrapped also if i want to be a, ma- a marketing led company a distribution led company it's going to be very hard for me so then i while i was contemplating this this was uh, very luckily and it luck plays played a huge role that as as luck played uh, how girish found me wanted to give me 250000 dollar for a guy who have not even raised any round before and first time entrepreneur that same luck played me when uh, manish the ceo of printo found me and said hey uh, isaac i see this is a great model that you are building a great technology layer we already have an infrastructure layer and can you build for us 
then that uh, at that time one thing which kind of uh, uh, made me very very comfortable was what did i see uh, what did ink monk see in that occasion to answer that right whatever things that we have built so far had a happy home right had a good uh, longevity and printo was already a profitable company were already at 12 years old company which were which have seen two bubbles uh, one was the 2008 and right now the covid bubble right so they are a very very profitable company ebitda positive and they have extra money every every year some very little not the vc uh, side type of money right every small money every year which they can fund into interesting r and d projects and that became inkwonk and printo.in which they started uh, investing in so i believed that this is going to have a good home and the longevity of the idea which i wanted to do so that and uh, you know printo was actually willing to keep both the brands the the dream of inkmonk to build that micro entrepreneurs print entrepreneurs across india to elevate th- their businesses building their spare capacity they said i will continue b- uh, funding that dream and uh, there is another dream where we want to build that omni channel experience for printo with the same technology that we have built so now the team was super motivated because they are building two different things two two things in the same uh, technology infrastructure which was super motivating for everyone and then we finally decided this is a great call to make how is the journey been uh, because it's been a couple of years since the acquisition has happened yeah. um everything l- looks like most marriages um yeah. everything looks great during courtship and yeah. then uh, re- reality and and i'm not and i'm and i use the word most marriages right there are happy marriages it's just that uh, nobody talks about them people only talk about unhappy marriages yeah. um what's been the last couple of, what what's it been like last couple of years yeah yeah so uh, there are uh, both challenges as well as uh, uh, you know the goods and the bads right so Uh, the good is you know as i told you all these things are happening uh, also the bad i would say not the bad but more of the challenge here is that uh, uh, surviving an acquisition itself is a interesting phase right you mean integrating so, integrating that two teams of different culture culture right? yes and different upbringing right you have a different father and you have a different father here or a mother here right so they if those two childs have to bring together with a synchronized uh, passion of running a business it's it's a it's a challenge by itself so we did have to make a few adjustments on both the sides so printo had to learn a few culture of us we had to learn a few, few culture of us and uh, today i can write a book about surviving an acquisition or integrating that acquisition <laughs> together but uh, it's a uh, and for an entrepreneur that's uh, i would say if i were learning how to build companies in the last 7 5 years in inkmonk i learned uh, in the last two years another free mba course uh, through the model of acquisition about how do you work with different management different teams in integrating them together in building a solo culture together because you cannot have two different languages in the same home right and when when the people don't understand both the languages together so that's going to be a problem right so then uh, uh, that, that's how i uh saw some of the challenges but you know even eventually we nailed out a few things uh so on the culture part with the other side is also that how do we grow from here right so how do we take this manifest this and build a team around this and you know so that involves uh, you know when it, when it was ink monk it was like 20 member team a uh, 25 member team to be precise with printo it is a 900 member team right and they are across india across different cities now the hierarchy of decisions also come and kick in the way of over communicating things also have to kick in so all these were you know very interesting things which uh, i uh, happened and uh, uh, these were all the other learnings that i had during that acquisition phase yeah interesting i i i still think uh, printing industry in india is more, much more than a billion dollar business um because uh, uh, one part the i think the place where you can see in the indian context where uh, some part of it gets changed which is the oyo example um and unfortunately it hasn't lived lived up quite uh, to the promise because the whole idea is to aggregate all of these disparate 
living places and elevate the standards at least to a certain minimum because you know what to expect while still preserving the independence that the operators have um right so that's the basic premise uh, of that promise and uh, these independent operators obviously don't make life easy either uh, trying to disintermediate the platform and do bookings directly so that they can avoid all those uh, those are those are understandable but i still but i still think um, um, in india uh, in terms of having predictability to that order book uh, making sure that that uh, capacity utilization has a certain degree of predictability to it certain constancy and uh, they are printing more higher margin orders uh, because it need not necessarily be that only bulk orders have larger margins or on demand orders have larger margins so there there is a whole host of evolutionary problems still uh, right because the the other thing is uh, the local print shops they don't have standardization either uh, what you see when you walk into a printo shop is not what you see uh, in another uh, printing shop so there's a whole host of uh, problems yet remaining unsolved uh, in those places as well and i'm sure uh, you see that it is much much more than a billion dollar business but like you said the patience aspect of it uh, but, but i do it's just a personal uh, opinion that uh, many times i think it looks like a 15 year problem but you, but not everything takes that 15 year time frame um some happen at 3 years some happen at 8 some happen at uh, maybe 10 some end up actually taking 15 or maybe 17 years but most i think happen around the 8 9 year time frame something comes together some industry context changes um and uh, that brings in a whole host of things all together so amazing um so now uh, what what's what's the next step building uh, ink monk further or you're on to something new yeah so it's been around 2 years since a uh, uh, acquisition happened uh, after the acquisition i i had a little setback i said okay it's a breather for me 5 years building uh, in a very intense fashion uh, i got acquired the same year i got married so uh, <laughs> so then and uh, i wanted to i was exploring a couple of things what next to do and uh, uh, you know one of the very interesting things the, the mindset was to elevate lifestyles right so personally for me i have slogged at least like another 7 years down in my career so what uh, there there needs to be some happiness quotient to that so what can i what can i go to a lifestyle with and which business can support that lifestyle so that i was started starting <laughs> to think that way so and then i put some checklist of things that i want to build a a global company i wanted to build a uh, I, I i still want to be in india and also move little to the uh, rural areas like uh, you know down south a little where cost of living is also a little more cheaper but the quality of air and quality of things that you get around is a you know inspired by little of sridhar vembu from zoho as well <laughs> uh, then uh, while and also build a global team across different parts of the world and uh, have and one one area which was always check, checking that checkbox was saas because uh, saas had this uh, uh, all, all almost all the things that i just mentioned and also had a 7x advantage of indian dollar pricing right indian rupee to dollar pricing so sitting in india doing sales and building that uh, brand and uh, building that you know uh, uh, that model of you know uh, making sure uh, the global company and the global team happens already there were other people who have took the baton forward and running like grish and sridhar and uh, uh, krish from charge b and a few other people right so they have done that game so with all those inspiration i felt like maybe sh- i should start something in saas industry uh, and uh, uh, then i now today uh, i'm uh, building this company called train t r a i n n dot c o dot co and uh, train is uh, train helps basically saas companies to accelerate product adoption uh, and uh, in mission critical areas like onboarding right 
and uh, they, the problem was more like scratching my own itch when i was building inkmonk it was a software and people were introduced to the software uh, an online designer for the first time where they have to put their logo on the t-shirt and customize the text and everything so there i have to teach them how the design interface works with a small video which is like a 2 minutes video about hey uh, here are the the parts of the video this watch it so when i did that when i had that video and when i did not have that video the conversion funnel of people going to the next step increased drastically so which means like videos were great engaging content for people to educate and then perform certain actions so i was thinking the same problem will be applicable to other software companies who are building more complex systems right so but why are they not using video we uh, and, uh, and and you know traditionally from uh, if we buy a dslr camera inside the dslr camera you will get a 100 page uh, manual book which will have all the how to do and everything no one cares about these days no one even reads about it so we go to youtube and then start learning about it right so people now these days find videos as a great engagement platform and uh, but most of the companies still rely on textual basis so then i decided that hey there is some problem here let me talk to all the product people who are not using videos to solve the uh, education product education problem or adoption problem so i had around 72 interviews with product managers across the globe which different time zones different countries found them in linkedin gave them a request and had a chat with them for 30 minutes ranted about uh, what are their adoption challenges and uh, maybe why did not they did not use videos and everyone said they wanted videos so that was validation but everyone said that they cannot make videos because videos are painstakingly hard to create because they cannot understand video audio timeline cropping trimming uh, adjustments and uh, you know uh, playback speed and all these things right so they are not tech uh, or or they are not from uh, design or uh, video visual communication background right so they are just simple product managers who know how to build products so for them i was thinking if i can create a tool where they just need to go and click on multiple areas inside their software and i can create a video out of that and they can explain that with a voice over which is also automatically created for them uh then that would be a beautiful experience so i was building an experience level platform so then i uh, you know in my call i used to show them a demo of the product which i didn't build i basically showed a a prototype which was like a design and then i showed this is a product which is live and i uh, you know uh, fake it till you make it right so uh, then i showed a video output which says which i asked them hey do you like it and they said everyone liked it so then that uh, while i was doing that interview one of my other friend uh, one of my uh, interviewee so the person whom i interviewed uh, was a product manager who had worked in charge b before and who had moved on to a different company but two ex employees of charge b who quit charge b last year were trying to build a similar idea so their core engineers had worked around 3 and 1/2 years in charge b before that they were in other saas companies in chennai uh, now chennai also has this mafia group right so they all these big companies like zoho and freshdesk and uh, charge b have now started developing their next level of entrepreneurs who are coming out of that country so interestingly i got inter- uh, introduced to these two chaps we spoke about life we spoke about lifestyle which we want to build first that was the conversation for two weeks then we spoke about what was the interesting product which we both were thinking at the same time and uh, interestingly they had built a prototype uh, similar to mine and we said okay this seems to be a great mix because they were looking for a business person i was looking for a tech people right so techy and we all three uh, joined together as co-founders we incorporated the company uh, we uh, launched the product to public around the mid of september and uh, it's been around like couple of months since we ran it like in public we kind of started doing marketing from jan a very in the early stage we are roughly at around 550 dollars mrr at this moment with eight paying customers uh, validation is there like uh, 70% of the people customers they, they have never even met them they just came to our saw our product they tried the experience they liked it and they purchased it so uh, it seems that there is some level of validation here so then i said okay it seems interesting so let's continue building that so, uh, so that's that's about train and uh, it's very exciting for me uh, 
uh, at this moment to build that company as well. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, more power to you. It does look like, in fact, I'll give you one more validation. That video is what we need. Uh, that's the next thing that's on our list right now uh, for our uh, payment protection uh, product. I'm sure uh, I guess we'll venture on to train and then see what we can uh, get there. Uh, so looking back at your journey, what are the moments that you cherish and what are the moments um, that you think you could have avoided? Or regrets, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll tell one in each. The one thing that I cherish the most is building a great team. Uh, I I used to tell very proudly to people that uh, I I used to hire like disciples of Jesus Christ. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so very... And you're speaking and like to, a conversionist now. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> no, I have to have a flag. I'm not doing that. So, so yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so I used to uh, spend a lot of hours talking to people before even I engage with them because uh, uh, these are the people whom I'm going to be engaged for the next five years. Right. So, uh, my first employee of Inkmark is still there. My second employee of Inkmark is also still there. So, that's a very proud team that I built. So, that's something which I cherish a lot. Something which I kind of uh, uh, regret that I didn't know very well uh, while I was building Inkmonk is uh, financial management, right? So I was always the top line guy running after top line numbers, sometimes even running after vanity metrics, right? So like uh, in us usually in marketplaces, people tend to uh, run after GMV as a gross merchandise value as a vanity metric. But eventually there are other important metrics like retention and you know, your equity, sorry, your EBITDA and uh, EBITDA positive and cash flow makes a lot of sense. So, and your uh, own revenue. Yeah, and our own revenue. Right? Not so, GMV. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's the, uh, that's when, uh, but I, I perfected it over years. Then now I'm not going to do the same mistake again with train. Uh, hopefully, but, uh, uh, but yeah, these are some things which I wish I knew very far, very much early because that could have given me a little more leverage in certain areas and uh, stopped certain decisions which were forcefully done by certain, uh, you know, people around me, right? So that could have been like, you know, hey, go after this, go after this, go after this. But, you know, I would lose money if I go after that. I could have stopped them. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so. It's it's not easy. Who to listen to, what to listen to is also an art in itself. I, I think one of the worst things is for a... Uh, bootstrapped or an angel funded company uh, because there's so much noise around us which just permeates from hyper funded startups right and they have their own problems um, I, I i don't think there is any merit in painting them in the wrong color uh, but they're what they're after is something different i still remember for my previous startup um, we put some incentives together when you saw the product take off when we took away the incentives the product actually stalled uh, and I stopped doing it, saying that I'm not getting a sticky customer. I'm not going to burn cash because I'm not funded like a VC company. You won't believe me. One of the investors uh, in the board meeting, eventually when we presented our annual accounts, actually cursed me, saying, if you had come to me and asked me for more money and you had put it all down the brand, building the brand and done more incentives, I would have given it to you. I said, no, today you are saying that in hindsight. But that day, if I, because you, you didn't have a $5 million or $10 million to give me, you didn't have that much, that kind of money. You're underestimating what it takes to uh, push there. And if I am a bootstrapped and a small angel funded company, I, if I keep making the mistake of assuming that I have to measure myself by the same metrics that a VC company does, VC funded company does, I'm making a grave mistake there because somewhere I'm going to crash and burn, right? Uh, a Cessna Citation, which is a two-engine plane, uh, can only soar so high. It cannot soar as high as a Boeing, but it can still make the voyage. It cannot make it as fast. So it, there are some practical limitations that we have to work around. And I think uh, that comes with trial and error. It, uh, even, for a, um, even for successful entrepreneurs, which is why you don't see the Midas touch with a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, they succeed in one. And most of the time, if they're doing something the second time, it is usually an extension of what they've done the first time around uh, because market changes or context changes. 
excellent uh, um, great conversation uh, isaac uh, ex uh, awesome uh, i'm glad you were candid and uh, spoke from the heart this is going to be a phenomenal episode in closing the uh, two things do you read yep oh, what's on your reading list right now so i'm reading uh, this book called competing against luck by chris clayton ah okay clayton christensen yeah the professor on of innovation so that's that's a that's a terrific book by the way um and uh, just one correction for our listeners the erstwhile quote that i attributed flying cars versus 140 characters is actually from peter thiel and not paul graham um so uh, paul graham tweets like crazy but peter thiel uh, barely does and in in closing if there was uh, maybe a one liner that you had to share with uh, people who are either battling out battling it out in the trenches or contemplating beginning something uh, what would it be yep so uh, entrepreneurship is a very lonely journey uh, as long as uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's not for uh, every it's not for the weak hearted so uh, but uh, there are uh, a, over this is the this is the first wave of people that we are seeing who are building together as community we are all building internet based brands right so uh, back then i i touch it you i i used to believe it 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 used to be super lonely for our fathers and grandfathers where they were also entrepreneurs who were building uh, solo right so now uh, now that we have enough help so i'm a big believer of uh, you know take care of your personal health and take care of your mental health as well so uh, we don't generally talk about this but uh, i there are uh, uh, one thing that i like to tell to all entrepreneurs is if you are feeling very very uh, alone or lonely in that journey or very painfully going through that process uh, and feels like everything is slowing down or everything is seems to be not working please seek help from nearby peers of entrepreneurs and communities of entrepreneurs who are building meaningful companies right and uh, and please talk to a lot of people have that network at least build a network just for that uh, uh, not for business business can come secondary but at least for that stressing down that mental pressure right so that uh, because it's not going to be an easy one and uh, uh, and i am available as well i think krishna also will be available for the entrepreneurs who are listening to such episodes so uh and uh, everything i think all the gyan about uh, you know passion grit perseverance everything is eventually you will learn on on your own uh, that i think there is no teacher for that uh, so so stick to that mental and uh, uh, personal health a lot because uh, as a first time because i am telling this from a second time entrepreneur and krishna is probably talking from a fifth time entrepreneur <laughs> so please focus on that is something and maybe krishna if you want to add a few on this yeah no this is this is awesome in fact uh, for quite some time i've been contemplating i'm part of this forum network called startup leadership program and we've lost a couple of people um, in fact who who um, through the to the challenges uh, that people go through as an entrepreneur and you absolutely nailed it uh, when you said it's a lonely journey i've been contemplating launching some sort of a call me to talk so to speak for entrepreneurs uh, because we reach out when we need connects or partnerships um, and uh, there is also some sort of an ego that comes in between because then when you're reaching out for help in some sense you're admitting a temporary failure right um, trust me we are going through a cup we've gone through that ups and downs in the last 5 uh, 6 months uh, the second day we launched a platform and we didn't even have a prototype all we had was a single page website and we saw a user do a 1.3 lakh rupee transaction and we said what validation can we ask for and we went ahead and then built the product and now uh, all the people that said they have the problem they would it, it is like a problem that everybody has but refuses to use the product mm -hmm. and uh, it's not easy and now we've realized that uh, we have to be strong and we have to be resilient uh, ab absolutely well said uh, thank you for making yourself available 
when i put that initiative together i think uh, maybe we should just put a team of entrepreneurs together who say hey yeah, if you want to talk uh, we'll reach out to we help we'll help you reach out to one of them and then they'll be available so awesome isaac this has been a phenomenal conversation this is exactly what gives me energy uh, whenever i come to a new conversation we are hitting close to 50 episodes uh, shortly uh, and um, the research that goes on before the episode we we put in lot of effort before and after it uh, and it's a labor of love uh, but it all of that gets validated when you have a great conversation conversation like this more power to you and then more power to ink monks eventual growth and then train as well it Thanks, was great Krishna. to have you on the show thank you thank you same here we hope you enjoyed this story if this story made a difference to you tell us by leaving a comment on the website or our social media channels help us spread the love by subscribing liking and sharing our show we welcome speaker suggestions and collaboration write to me at tanya@maharajasofscale.com at